Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to gather in a place where you dwell in such a mighty way. We pray, dear Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us, dear Lord, and help remove the blinders from our eyes. Help us, O oh Lord, to see your beauty in this place. Help us, O oh Lord, to feel your presence. Help us, O oh Lord, to feel your closeness. Help us, O oh Lord, to feel your dwelling within us. Help us, O oh Lord, to feel that you're working within us. Help us, O oh Lord, to have faith, to know that you're leading us and guiding us and carrying us and protecting us and planning for us and leading us to your kingdom. I thank you, dear Lord, because of your interventions in our lives. I thank you, dear Lord, and I ask that you never stop in our lives and in this church. I pray for your mercy, your forgiveness, your blessing, and your presence in a mighty way always among us. Come meet us here right now. The intercession of St. Mary, all your angels, all your saints, hear us when we are children cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going through this series on prayer. Um, we, this might be our last one. We might do one more. Over the last, I don't know, month and a half or so, I feel as though maybe we're getting more consistent. Does anyone remember the goals of the prayer? We said there were six goals of the prayer. When you go into your prayer room to meet God, what were the six goals? I don't have them written down, so I don't even know if I remember them. How one of them was worship. Remember we said oftentimes when we pray, we pray about what we want. We never glorify God at all. And thank you. One of them is worship. One of them is thanksgiving. One of them is supplication for others. So intercession, sanctification was one. Conforming my will to his was another. And then we also, I think, said personal supplication. And then I told you a verse that I thought everyone, it had so many of those. And you guys all say it every day, right? It's where? Colossians 1, 9 through 11. That you might increase in the knowledge of His will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That you might be fruitful in all that you do, pleasing Him. That you may walk worthy of Him. And that you might increase in your knowledge of Him. And that He might give you strength and patience to endure with joy. It encompasses almost all of those. You can say it in one minute, but it does have all those things. So we've talked about some of the purposes of prayer. We've talked about some of the obstacles of prayer, some of the etiquette of prayer. But there's something missing, which uh, I long for. You know, sometimes we pray in the morning. We go to a room. Sometimes we pray at night. Sometimes we're praying maybe every other day. But you go to a place, and that's where you oftentimes meet him. But what I'm missing is the period between my set prayers. Oftentimes I feel like, okay, I go meet God there, but then He's gone the rest of the day. And so we only spend two times a day with God. And I think it's great to have the place to pray to God. But sometimes I wonder, are we caging Him in the rooms that we pray? Are we making Him stay in that area. It just happened on our way to church. We pray on our way to church, we close our eyes, we talk to God, and then as soon as we open our eyes, as if God's not there. And I realized, it's not that God's not there, it's not that He isn't with me, the issue is, I'm not with Him. He's with us everywhere. And so let me read this Psalm, Psalm 139. Just verses 1 to 10. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. I say sure and sorry, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. He was saying there's no place that I could go away from your presence. You know my every thought, you know my every word, and I could never hide from you. He's going before us and after us. He is present, always. And the problem is, I'm not aware of it. How great would it be to be aware of the Holy One, the Powerful One, the Faithful One, the Listener, the Father, the Friend, the Counselor, right next to you, at all times, every place. Your favorite person with you all day. I guess I would be so comfortable with him that I'd probably tell him everything if I knew, that, if I realized that he was always there. I would share all my thoughts when I actually had them and not wait till the next time I pray. I would actually probably confess my sins a lot more. I would probably control my sins a lot more. I would seek his guidance. I would be more courageous. I would have more faith. I would be more real. I would probably be more in love with God. And it's actually an incredible state to be aware of the presence of God always. There is a verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It says, pray unceasingly. Pray always. And for many that sounds incredibly difficult. It actually is very difficult. But there are certain things that we can do. And this is one of the things that we're encouraged to do. This is one of the things our church has developed. Is this praying unceasingly. And so what are the issues with being aware of the presence of God? It's not God. It's us. So there's two things. Do I desire his presence. And number two, can I commit to practicing His presence? Here's the issue. Do we desire to be around God all the time? I mean, isn't it too much? Like, don't you want your time away from God? Like, while I'm at work, or while I'm watching TV, while I'm shopping at the mall? I mean, do I want God with me all the time? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what our tendencies are. Am I comfortable with having a limited interaction and relationship with God? Or do I really want more? Do I feel as though it would be much better if I was with Him all the time? I've read about saints who they're conversing with God throughout the entire day. I'm very envious of that, where they're just talking to God like a friend, or as Christ the Savior, but all the time. When I think of that, and I think what I get from God when I have a great time with Him, it brings me lots of peace. It brings me comfort. It actually brings me so much joy. And so now, if you have been praying in your homes, you have been enjoying the prayer in the set times that we've said, do you want to take a further step? Do you want to take God further and not cage Him in your prayer room or your office or wherever it is you pray. So what I realize is the reason why I'm not in His presence all the time is because my mind is not triggered. I realize I need triggers in order for me to turn my attention towards Him even if it's just for a moment. Even if I can turn my attention towards Him just for a moment throughout the day, I slowly would become more conscious of Him around me. So, what we're looking for is a trigger to prioritize our thoughts and our intentions. My friend, he has an alarm on his phone and it's around noon. And that reminds him to text his wife at noon and say something nice to her, like he loves her or something. 
And so he has to remind himself to text him. I'm sure after a while he gets it. But what if we set these triggers for ourselves? Is it possible? Is it possible to turn our minds and our thoughts towards God more frequently? There's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, and it says... It talks about bringing every thought into captivity. He says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Is it possible for us to bring our minds and our thoughts into the obedience of Christ? I mean, this would require work. There was a monk, a story of a monk, who he would be working and making baskets all day. And so while he was working, he would have two baskets in front of him. One basket would be thoughts of God. One basket would be thoughts not of God. So as he's working, every time he had a thought of God, he would put a stone in the God thought basket. When he had other thoughts, he would put it in the other basket. And at the end of the day, he would see which basket had more stones. The basket that had more stones would determine whether or not he ate that day. If he thought about God more often, he would eat that day. If not, he wouldn't. We would starve very quickly in this congregation, I imagine. But I would imagine you would begin to start triggering yourself how many days are you going to go where you say, you know what, I need to start thinking about God more often throughout my day. Maybe because we don't see the consequence, the negative consequence of not thinking about God, that we just continue to not think about Him, and it's okay with us. How amazing would your life be, would your children's lives be, would the people around you be, if you were always aware of the presence of God? So, there are several ways that we can bring God into our day and turn our attention to Him. So, I'm going to start off with one that's general. The hours of the day are split up for the Orthodox Christians by the Igbeya. Right? We have the 1st, 3rd, 6th, 9th, 11th, 12th, and the midnight hour. We're given those hours, those are reminding us about a specific time in Christ's life. Now, we may not be able to be praying all the hours of the Igbeya, but every hour is significant. So if when you rose, and first hour is the rising of the sun, it's a sign of the resurrection, it's the beginning of seeing the glory of God and what He's planned for you in that day. If the rising of the sun triggered you regularly where the first hour was, this is where I glorify God for His resurrection, I thank Him for my resurrection, and His glory, and His power, and His plans for me that day. It happens every day that the sun rises. Every day. Nine o'clock happens every day too. That's when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles. What about if at nine o'clock we'd say, God, please visit me with your Holy Spirit at this time as you did the apostles, which is in the absolution prayer of the third hour. You say, God, Please let your spirit cleanse my mind, cleanse my heart. Let your spirit convict me or move me to do something that would be pleasing to you. At the sixth hour, which is at noontime, which is at lunch, for most of us, what happens at the sixth hour? He's crucified on the cross. Wouldn't it be great if at noontime we were lifting our minds and thinking about the one who loved us and gave himself for us and died on the cross? Like, how endearing would your lunch be if you could spend that time, a lot of us eat alone at lunch, what if you could spend that time with the one who was crucified for your sake? Or in the evening as the sun is setting and you're thinking about him being lifted off the cross and the love of the people that carried him and buried him and took him. And you say, well, what if I could offer him something right now? Just the hours of the Igbeya could be a time where if you just remembered him those six or seven hours, I'm not going to ask you to wake up at midnight. Although it's not a bad thing, but if you did, if you remembered God those six times during the day, 
And there are very meaningful events in Christ's life that you could easily turn into a prayer. And of course, you can pray for many other things. But what if, in, at the beginning of every hour, let's say you set your phone to go off at 9, 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, every hour. What if you offered God the first minute of every hour? I'm not asking you to pray the whole hour every hour, but what if you offered God one minute of every hour? I mean, I go through monotonous things at work. I'm just doing work after work after work, but I need that interruption where I say, God, I'm so involved in this work, but I have still remembered you, and I want you to be here in my presence. So what I'm asking is that you trigger yourself by the hours of the day. Don't let noon, when the clock hits 12, don't let that be a meaningless time. Let that time in which Christ died on the cross for you be a crucial time. Let that be an inspiring time. Let that be a time of comfort and joy and drawing close to the one who loved you and gave himself for you. So the first thing is your triggers will be the hours of the day. So the second one are just the arrow prayers, the Jesus prayers. And these are adjustable, but they really draw you close. When you get into the practice of saying the name of Jesus, it's actually supposed to be something sweet. You know, in, in Arabic, you know, it's actually more pleasant to say Yeshua. It's a little bit more pleasant than Jesus because Jesus is a little bit more harder, but it's still a beautiful thing. My Lord Jesus. And so there's the prayer that we're taught, My Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But one of the monks taught us to just personalize it, and every moment you can make it according to your need. For example, a mom who is at home with three kids and is about to pull out her hair, my Lord Jesus Christ, give me peace. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me self-control. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me purity of thought. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me courage. My Lord Jesus Christ, embrace me right now. My Lord Jesus Christ, whatever. It could be whatever. Give me patience, comfort me. These are the way you sanctify your thoughts and if you can do this before you sleep, the chances are that your dreams will be more pleasant as well. You know the story of the pilgrim who in the 1800s, the Russian pilgrim who goes and he tries to obey this verse, pray unceasingly, and he acquires the Jesus prayer. You have to read the book called The Way of a Pilgrim. It's a fantastic book. But I remember he would just walk. He didn't have a car. So he would just walk. Sometimes he'd say, I would walk 40 miles a day. And I wouldn't even know it because he was saying the Jesus prayer continuously to the point where his heart was beating to the Jesus prayer. He says when it was cold, he would say the Jesus prayer, he would be warm. He said when he was sick, the Jesus prayer gave him strength. And just by saying the name of Jesus, he was with Christ in the presence of God all the time. I feel bad, but I feel as though we do not use the name of Jesus Christ enough, at least in a good way. We might be using it in the wrong way. But... What if you started this practice of saying the Jesus prayer 50 times a day, slowly? And if you were to say it as simply as you want, but it repetitively, my Lord Jesus Christ, visit me now. My Lord Jesus Christ. And when you say it in a way that's endearing, you feel his presence among you, and the more you get used to it, it allows your tongue to pr pronounce it often, it allows your mind to go on it often, it allows your heart, allows your spirit, allows all of you to be united. And what it does is it changes your dialogue from being self-centered to God-centered. Because now you're saying His name all the time. And you're calling Him my Lord. It has to be an endearing term, but if you were to just say my Lord Jesus Christ, Help me as I drive and take the kids to school. My Lord Jesus Christ, help me as I'm preparing the food. Um, whatever you're doing, but present your thoughts to God. So number one, be triggered by the hours of the day. Number two, short prayers using the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Number three, 
Chew on the Bible. Chew on the Bible. Snacks last us all day. When we're going throughout our day, we eat breakfast, we usually eat a snack, we'll usually eat lunch, we'll eat at work, we'll eat before a workout, we'll eat after a workout. We will eat so many times a day. Some of us eat big meals. And we're constantly chewing on something. What if we were to chewing, what if we were chewing on a verse? Something that we were contemplating from the morning. I know a lot of us listen to sermons on our way to work. How many of us are reading the Bible early in the morning where there's a verse? Now this is really well done when you have a devotional. Where you're reading a quick passage and it's a well chosen passage and at the end there's one verse. And those really can touch you, move you. There's all kinds of devotionals. I'm not going to recommend one. If you want one for men, one for women, one for parents, one for spouses, one for anyone searching for God, Jesus calling, they're all out there. But when you have a verse on your day, a verse on your mind that you're chewing on throughout the day, um, it really allows you to spend the day thinking about God and conversing with God. God, what is it that you're asking me? Like, why are you putting this on my heart? Don't just read it and close the Bible. Read it and let it sit in your heart. The Bible says, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. A lot of times we don't let it dwell with us. We kick it out as soon as we close the Bible. But what about work? I mean, could we pray while we're at work? I just had a conversation with a priest this week and it blew my mind away. I said, I want to stop working. I'm tired of my job. I wish I could just spend time serving. He says, Mark, do you know what the word is in Coptic service? He says, it's Chimchi. Everyone knows that, I know that. Chimchi, right? You know where we get the name, the word Shemes, which is deacon? From Chimchi. Shemes and Chimchi. So the deacon means to serve. This is like the deacon, his service is the liturgical service. Like at the altar, he says, this awesome example of like, he says, there's the, a liturgy is a priest, the deacon, the people, and that's a symbol of the Trinity, and the priest represents God the Father, and the deacon is the Son, who is the power of God, and he serves the people and the priest. And he says, Mark, you're a deacon. He says, and you're a radiologist. You are serving the Father and his people. He says, when you have your screen on the table, that table is your altar. And those members, those bodies, literally body parts, are members of the body of Christ. Mark, what you are doing is an offering to God. And I went to work the last two days thinking, when I sit at my table that I can't stand, I'm like, you know what, now it's become an altar. And I said, you know what, God, I'm going to do the best of my ability for your glory. All of a sudden, it sanctified my work. That you could offer everything you do, whether you are a teacher or a banker or even an Uber driver, I mean, the altar is your car, and your service is the people, and you are bringing them, like, you could offer everything at work. Oftentimes, you know, there is the verse, blessed are the poor in spirit. And it never hit me until we studied that a couple years ago. Poor in spirit means, like I'm a beggar, like I'm unable to to do things without your grace. So when I get to work, one of the first thing you do is, Dear God, I cannot do this job without you. And I ask for your assistance. Isn't it great to take God into the office with you? Say, God, I'm going here and I need you today because I have a terrible boss or I have a terrible co-worker or whatever, or I have stress and I want you with me. I'm going to see those patients that are dry. I want you to be here with me. Bring God to work. Don't leave him when you just heard the sermon in the car, take him with you. You can also ask him to be there in the place when you leave. How amazing is it for those people, and I know people that do this, but when they get to work, the first thing they do is they open their Bible. What if when you enter into your building, you say, God, I'm going in with you, or you spend five minutes with God before you start? Now you're offering God even more parts of the day. So we said, number one, in His presence throughout the day, in His name, by His word, while at work, with a spirit of gratitude. 
spirit of gratitude. I just saw a clip. Um, Stephen Dawking was a scientist. I don't know if you've heard of him. He had ALS. Um, it is this very crippling disease. He's this genius who's like creating these equations that are just showing that like God is the creator of the universe. And yet he's crippled, like he can't hold a fork, he can hardly move. And I, I think I have a reason to be thankful every single moment. There's not a single reason for me to not be thankful. You know, it's cold outside and I can say thank you dear Lord that I get to be inside. There are so many people that are, I could be outside, and so many people that live in Siberia. There's like, there's so many reasons. I have food, I have clothes, I have, I have people around me, I have a job. I have like, beauty around me, like, I love beauty. Like, I, at work, I cannot sit in my office straight. I usually have to get up and walk around, and I walk around, and I just look at, I like to walk outside, and if there's grass, there's flowers, there's trees, there's a blue sky, and I just am thankful. If you had a spirit of gratitude throughout the day, you would feel that God is so close to you because you'll feel as though He's providing for your every need, for everything. Um, the more you thank Him, the more you receive everything by His hand. And I'm sure that we have good things that happen at work. Thank you for closing this deal, or thank you for, you know, that pleasant interaction, or thank you for my friendly, smiling, you know, secretary, or whatever. There's so many reasons to just be thankful. Um, so, what I want you to learn is, in His name, every hour, by His word, with his heart in his presence. I forgot to say at work, I forgot to say to have with his heart. You know, most of us work with other people unless you work in this office at your home by yourself and the door is closed, which is probably just my situation. The rest of you probably work with humans. And so, this is an opportunity for you to actually ask God to work in your heart for the sake of the people around you. So then you could say, God, give me the heart for so-and-so. I know so-and-so is having a difficult marriage. I know so-and-so is stressed about paying their bills. I know so-and-so's mother is dying. I know so-and-so. Like, every one of us who knows people at work, if you've asked anyone, there's a reason for you to be there. What if you are the heart of Christ among the people around you? So, say it with me. Every hour, in His name, through His Word, with His heart, giving thanks. And then I'm going to add number six, silence. In His presence. We tend to avoid silence a lot. We're always filling our minds with something. Um, in the car we listen to stuff. At home we watch TV. Um, and every moment in between we look at our phone. Like we rarely just put it away and not look at anything other than just be quiet. For many of us, because of this addiction to outside filling, we have this unrest within us. One of my favorite verses is, which we read in the third hour of the Bay in Psalm 46, Be still and know that I am Lord. Silence. What if you just, when work is stressful, when taking kids, care of kids is stressful, when driving is stressful, close off everything. I don't want you to close your eyes when you're driving. At other times it might be okay. But just be quiet. Just be quiet and say, God, I'm listening. I'm listening to you. I'm giving you this five minutes. Whatever it is, you will find how calming it is for you. Sometimes you have to sit in a certain chair in your house. Sometimes it might be a rocking chair. Sometimes it might be an icon next to you. But this is a time where you just think about His goodness, His will, His presence. So, in His name, every hour, by His word, with His heart, in His presence, giving thanks. And the last thing is caring for others. 
caring for others. In dealing with people, everybody knows someone who's suffering. It's very easy to request compassion or wisdom. Show an interest in others and ask Christ to show you who he wants you to serve. So is it possible for us to allow Christ to be with us throughout the day? I was reading a story of a lady who, you know, she was constantly praying. And this idea or this concept, practicing the presence of God, comes from a monk, Brother Lawrence, a Catholic monk in the 15 or 1600s. He worked in the kitchen, and he constantly practiced the presence of God. He was cleaning dishes, he was serving people, but his mind was always on on God, and it was by doing things for God throughout the day. And this lady who was a cleaning lady, when she woke up and she washed her face, she says, Dear God, please cleanse not only my body, but cleanse my inside. As she prepared the food for others, she said, Dear Lord, I thank you because you are providing for my nourishment. Allow me, O Lord, to provide for others. Give me the heart for to do things for others as you do. And just throughout the day as she was cleaning people's homes or whatever, she would say, God, allow this place to be clean. You know, like, why do we iron? To take out wrinkles. God, can you remove the wrinkles in this situation? Like, you could turn everything you do into a conversation from morning until evening. Everything. As you're preparing food for your family, there's so much to be thankful for, to ask God for, to nourish, to take care of, to let it be strengthened. Everything you do. So as much as I've asked you to pray with your spouses, which I still have no idea what to do to get everyone to pray with their spouses, some of us are not able or a little bit shy or not at that level where we can just go and sit and read the Igbeya for an hour. These are simple, one minute, lifting your heart to God throughout the day. And you might feel His presence much more, and you might feel more drawn to Him that there will be those times where you do go out on a walk, or you do sit in your prayer room for 30 minutes, and you'll find that He is so close to you. So for one week, get your phones out, set your alarms, Hourly, every two hours, three hours, put it on vibrate so your co-workers don't hate you. Um, but trigger your minds and use the Jesus prayer and really go to work differently. Look at people differently this week and really just try to focus on being in God's presence. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, who is all present in all places and at all times, and especially with me and with all of us, you are so near to us, you are so a part of us, you are so inside of us. If I could only understand from your perspective what it is like to be born for most hours of the day, that you're walking with me and you're sitting around me and you're protecting me and you're going before me and behind me and you're listen to every thought, listen to every word, and so little of it is directed towards you. Dear Lord, I pray that you would sanctify my life, sanctify my mind, sanctify my eyes, my heart, my will, sanctify my life, dear Lord, in all of our lives. Allow us, Lord, to be more and more for you, so that we could become more and more like you. Dear Lord, I thank you that you have given us time. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to use it wisely. I thank you, dear Lord, that you've given us health, you've given us your word, you've given us people around us, and you've given us a purpose and a mission and experiences. I thank you, dear Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to turn our lives moment by moment, day by day towards you. I pray for those who have not yet known you, those who have not known the benefit of being in your presence. How many people, dear Lord, are dying to be in your presence? How much it would change the hurting the sorrowful, the lonely, I pray, dear Lord, that you would make yourself very manifest right now to some very needy and starving, very hungry people. I pray, dear Lord, that you would make your presence very manifest to us, our children, our spouses, our families, everyone around us, dear Lord. I pray your spirit give us the grace to be united as a church and as families. Grant us your mercy, your forgiveness of our sins. Through the intercession of St. Mary, um, all the angels, all the martyrs, all the saints, all those who have confessed your name faithfully with one voice, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.